we've been moved through the semiconductor material. And, uh, My name is William Chapner. In this film, I play John Tench, an electronics engineer. John works in the research center of the major communications company. He's one of a team developing new television technology. John has inherited pioneering traits that made his British ancestors successful early colonists. Some believe a rich land made this nation, others an energetic people. John Tench believes it was Yankee ingenuity. Innovation was the leverage that made our economy expand. Finding precedents to guide us or hold us back, so we invented our way out of problems. We had to. And in the process, created some new ones. Our ideas don't always work. We've often failed in our attempts to lever ourselves upward, but we keep trying. All ideas are welcome. It doesn't matter who found them or where they come from, as long as they work. The hang glider owes its heritage to the space program, NASA needed an inexpensive way to land capsules on land, and to Leonardo da Vinci, who sketched its principles 500 years ago. There's a classic example of innovation, applying an old idea to a new need and creating something else in turn. Capsules still splash down at sea, but the sport has taken off. Other countries have been more inventive. The Italians, French, Chinese, none more innovative. The difference? An invention is a bright idea. An innovation is putting an idea to work. Americans are down-to-earth pragmatic. We got our nation and our economy moving when we latched onto technology, innovation, and invention linked together. It was the only way we could add our available energies to the land's resources so we could make two and two equal five. Putting the steam engine on wheels is not as easy as it looks. How do you get it to move around corners? Once you get the iron horse going, how do you rein it in? And how do you build bridges to support it? Engineering, innovation's hard-working partner, had a lot to say about how this country grew. What drives Americans to solve tough problems? My family credits a streak of Scotch-Irish stubbornness. More detached observers credit our habit of figuring things out for ourselves. Our minds weren't closed off by past tradition. Others credit the profit motive. There's money in ideas at work. Some say we're plain lucky. By looking for one thing, we often found another. Whatever goaded us, worked. We were the first society to adopt innovation as a way of life. Canals had already tested us. How do you keep water from seeping into the ground? How do you keep the canal level so that the water doesn't all run to one end, leaving the other high and dry? Some lawyers tackled the job inventing equipment and techniques as they went. In eight years, 2,000 men and 4,000 horses and oxen built the Erie Canal, all 363 miles of it. Canals levered an enormous change in transportation. On a trail, two mules could carry six bushels. On a road, they could pull 25 bushels in a wagon. On a canal, two mules could pull more than 1,000 bushels in a barge. From the very beginning, we had to look for ways to make the most of our abundant resources, timber and land, with the least amount of our scarce resources, people. Leverage for legs and arms and backs came first. Adapt, improve, apply is what innovators swear by. It's become our credo. Find what works. When there is more work to be done than people to do, tools are needed. In the early days, our leverage was mechanical, and our innovators were usually blacksmiths. 
A traveler to 19th century America noted, America mechanizes as the ancient Greeks sculpted, and we mechanized as if our lives and livelihoods depended on it. Scotch-American Henry Burden developed a machine that could turn out 3,600 horseshoes an hour. In a single year, his factory produced shoes for 13 million horses. Eli Whitney's cotton gin helped hands become more productive. Unfortunately, he didn't share in the boom his invention created. It was too easily copied. He sought to recoup money spent on lawsuits against patent infringement with another invention. His goal, government contracts for muskets. This time, he made money and changed America. Whitney started a new kind of revolution when he made musket parts in a different way. Until Whitney. Individual parts for muskets or any other kind of machine had to be painstakingly fashioned by hand. But in the 1790s, there were far too few skilled hands to make machines America needed. Whitney used muskets to demonstrate to the nation and the government his conviction that a machine, rather than hands, could make many parts all exactly alike, so that any one musket part would interchange with all other parts. His attempt wasn't perfect. Some of the parts had to be filed to fit. But Whitney's concept gave birth to manufacturing. Meanwhile, another inventor was working on an idea which, in conjunction with Whitney's interchangeable parts, would give us mass production as we now know it. In 1785, Oliver Evans designed and built a continuous process mill that foreshadowed our modern assembly line by more than 100 years. Once corn entered the mill, it flowed untouched by human hands from process to process. A conveyor belt with buckets carried corn to the top of the mill, where by gravity it moved down through finer and finer millstones. That meant just six men, mainly employed in loading corn and bagging meal, could process 100,000 bushels a year. A driving force of innovation is competition. How do you increase productivity and lower costs? Do it or someone else will. We have always raced to find technologies that would improve efficiency. Millers in Evans' time automated or lost business to those who did. By 1837, one observer counted 1,200 Evans mills in just five states. Technology in the process had lowered the cost of ground meal. Eli Terry applied Whitney's idea to clocks. First clocks with wooden gears. Later he stamped out metal gears and lowered the cost of a clock from $25 to $5. Customs officials in England did not believe anyone could make a clock for $5 or one of their pounds, so they refused Terry's shipments as not being clocks. Meanwhile, Chauncey Jerome went one step better. With brass parts, he improved quality and lowered the price to $1.25. He sold more than 400,000 clocks in just one year, 1841. Nowhere was our practical streak more evident or out of place than at the Crystal Palace Exposition in London in 1851. The critics scorned our displays, preferring instead the wonders of Victorian design. The crowds, however, were delighted with Borden biscuits. Goodyear vulcanized rubber, McCormick reapers, Remington rifles, Colt pistols, Singer sewing machines. American made overnight became synonymous with manufactured and products that made sense. The Singer sewing machine brought leverage into the home, saving the American woman untold hours. By 1860, more than 116,000 sewing machines were at work, courtesy of some 3,000 salesmen. On the plains, there was no timber for traditional fencing. Cattle with different brands herded together and stamped across unprotected crops. Joseph Glidden used a coffee grinder to twist some wires and create one of the most rapidly accepted innovations in our history. Dozens of innovators soon twisted their own versions. Salesmen like John Gates demonstrated the wonders of the new wire. In the San Antonio Plaza, Gates pinned in some wild cattle, stood back and recited his spiel. Light as air, 
Stronger than whiskey, cheaper than dirt, all steel and miles long. The cattle ain't been born that can get through it. None could. In six years, barbed wire sales climbed from 10,000 to 80 million pounds. In a decade, America was fenced. We had become a settled land. But fences often cut off cattle from natural water sources. We adapted a centuries-old idea, windmills, to fit our needs. Windmills levered the prairie wind to pump water and to run equipment. A hundred and fifty thousand are still at work making use of an old energy source. Each solution seemed to pose a new problem which demands a new solution. From the first national patent in 1790 for a potash process to the latest of nearly four million, our patent office has been among the busiest in the world. By 1830, we were issuing patents at five times the rate of the British. Each new wave of business growth was followed by a wave of patents. One might argue that inventions were a byproduct of good times. We invented for rewards. Then business grew in the wake of each surge of patents. More invention, more growth. More growth, more inventions. It looked as though we had found our perpetual growth machine. Sometimes, though, it seemed like everybody wanted to cash in. I'll bet every American has some relative or ancestor who feels like they've missed out on some earth-shaking invention that would change their lives, change the world. Trouble is, we've been so prolific. Everybody's always running around with some million-dollar idea. Look around. Here are a few of those earth-shaking ideas. The government used to make you build a model before they would grant you a patent. Here's um, a washing machine. And a uh, paddle wheel. Cane seat. Would have been great to get in on the bottom floor of those. And here's an um, automatic fly brusher and fan. And a uh, bed bottom. Could have lost your shirt on those. Still, they're all the good ideas and the funny ones. Attempts to solve the new needs of a new nation. But you know, succeeding or failing were not so important. But what is important is the flood of ideas itself, the endless quest for that one big idea that would maybe start an industry or change our lives. I find this stuff around me here sort of touching. There's something innocent about our faith in ourselves, our ability to solve any problem that might come along. Something brave, too. Something that sets us apart. The last of the hayseed inventors and the first of the big-time innovators, Thomas Edison was an uneducated genius. His breakthroughs were the result of trial and error. It took him 6,000 tries to find the filament for the electric light. He also invented the process of invention itself. He turned his laboratory, to use his words, into an invention factory. It produced 1,093 patents and the research lab as we now know it. He had his failures, however. He spent two years trying to get rubber from goldenrod. He grew one strain that was 14 feet high and yielded better than 12% rubber, but his dream of sowing and mowing rubber never happened. As an innovator, he saw the profit in ideas and was shrewd enough to turn them into devices we could understand and want to buy. Look around. An improved telegraph. The mimeograph. The voting machine he patented when he was 21. To say nothing of the movie projector. He was the first to see the enormous potential in the home and in what we do with our leisure time. There was money to be made there. By harnessing electricity to the fractional horsepower motor, he made a thousand and one household tasks easier and our factories more efficient. And by turning night into day, Edison gave us time. Elisha Otis gave us space.
His safe elevator joined thousands of innovations that levered small towns into huge cities. We'd hardly finished exploiting one technology before impatiently turning to another. A chemical revolution followed the electrical. A new world of fibers like nylon were spun from arcane materials. The electronics revolution gave us the circuit, a way to control the bigger, better, faster world we had made. The government joined in, and our research and development labs expanded geometrically. Indeed, they formed a platform for entering space. No question, we're a nation committed to innovation as a way of life. In the process, we've reinvented just about everything, including the wheel. The skateboard reflects the fact that recreation also became a target for the innovator. A young engineer and surfer, Frank Nasworthy, added the gift of the plastics revolution, polyurethane, to the skateboard, and a new machine was born. Traction and stability improved. Then came a new undercarriage, and tricks of the sea became possible on land. Champions like Bruce Logan could then make the most of Newton's laws. A space-age material made the difference, and an industry. Nothing spurs the innovator like the possibility of profit. There are 30 million skateboards in America. Time and space were our new mediums, but we were still prisoners of our own physical limitations until John von Neumann gave us leverage for the mind, the programmable computer, the means by which a machine can instruct itself. Dr. Hermann Goldstein puts von Neumann's breakthrough into perspective. When you look at it, you can't conceive how anybody would not have known that there was one. Indeed, it must have been that the moment somebody mentioned the wheel or somebody mentioned the stored program, everybody around us, obviously, knew that this was the way to do it. This machine has stored program concept as its major feature, and that, in fact, is the thing which makes the modern computer revolution possible. The modern cotton gin scaled up to gain economies of scale. The mechanics are the same, but now rows of uniform machines continuously process cotton. Fractional horsepower electric motors create vacuums or drive belts to move cotton through the plant. All controlled by computer. A few men monitor the entire operation. Two centuries of innovation have made us spectators. We are caretakers of the machines we've made, the technologies we've harnessed. The cost of our almost unrestrained commitment to innovation has been high. One observer claims that our scrapyards tell the true story of our accomplishments. Cape Canaveral echoes this observation. The waste goes beyond just facilities or machines. Innovations also displace people. Forced to keep up, many of us fall behind and are scrapped as our skills are no longer needed. Technological unemployment. The unskilled become unusable. We have created a society that has given us more of everything, including casualties. Still, we keep moving because we believe in the next answer. I think one of the exciting things is whenever you have a new ideas or good ideas, once you to production, you really create a lot of jobs for all, all kinds of people. I think that's one of the exciting things. At this division, we started three years ago, I remember. We just upstairs, one little small cubicle about the 20 or 30 people. Now we have uh, 800 people. My name is Chang Tang. I had the idea of developing a, a truly handheld, pocket-sized programmable calculator. That time, the smallest one is above the typewriter size. So a lot of people told me it was impossible, and that is kind of dream. But anyway, I show Mr. Hewlett the ideas and how it will get done. And he would think about it, and he said, Chang, I know is, uh, I know electronically you can do almost everything, but I'm not sure about the packaging, all those challenges, technologies we don't have yet. But I think it's an exciting project. Why don't we just go ahead and give it a try? <laughs> so we just go ahead to do it. And, you know, the team started uh, growing from one person, myself, growing to two, three, and then finally consists of 15 people. We spent a total of about $2 million on the development of this project. And this is a really, truly handheld, programmable scientific calculator, suitable for every walk of life. When people are ready to use, they're just turning on the machine and feed the information into the memory. 
and we'll store there. And then you can enter your data and do the computation. Whenever we have a new product idea, we like to pass two criteria. One is contribution to the society, or to the, in our HP is uh, to scientific and engineering world. The second one is economics. We're going to make profit to support other uh, activities. Before von Neumann, human limits were finite. Now they're virtually infinite. Von Neumann's computer weighed tons and filled a room. Now the equivalent brain power is etched on a tiny chip. We can hold the computer revolution in our hand. Well, with the microcomputer, I think we'll be seeing uh, more and more applications where uh, it will pop up in the least uh, expected places. My name's Ted Hoff, and I'm the manager of uh, applications research here at Intel. My uh, charter is to look for places to use Intel technology. When you go into a store these days, you'll usually uh, find uh, your you know, money uh, being handled by a computer terminal, which actually has microcomputers in it. Um, people are now using them in various types of controls that will appear in the home, uh, you know, in ovens and washing machines and all sorts of things. So we're, the analogy here is one of the, the fractional horsepower computer. innovation sandwiched onto one microprocessing chip the three properties of a computer. Memory, operations, and program. His was a programmable chip. It could also be mass produced and is one of those rare innovations that simultaneously reduces manufacturing costs while increasing flexibility and value. One reason is the drop in component costs. The Hoff chip uses the equivalent of 2,500 transistors, each of which cost a thousandth of what one did 10 years ago. As one man observes, it's like putting an $8 price tag on an $8,000 Cadillac. 30 years after the first computer, there are some 200,000 computers in the world. 10 years from now, the microcomputer may well zoom that total to 20 million. We're in an awesome age. Computers grant infinite possibilities and responsibilities. They can control machines. Computers can even be instructed to design and build other computers. We are moving from economies of physical scale to economies of intellectual scale, but the goal and the gold remain the same as they always have. Find a need and then, uh, let us say, invent by the numbers, uh, supply an answer through technology for an established need. Uh, this technique was used uh, directly in the aero crane uh, by determining the need for an economical heavy lift vehicle in the timber harvesting industry to meet environmental and economic constraints that now exist. The timber harvest industry often has to cut a wide swath to get its lumbering accomplished. Building long truck roads deep into forests is expensive and destructive. How much better to be able to remove the trees from above? What we really needed was a new, a totally new, uh, economical heavy lift aerial vehicle to meet this need. Now, Mr. Donald Doolittle, who was then president of All-American Engineering, invented the aero crane in what can only be described as a flash of genius. A balloon with wings. It was not a normal device. Everyone else in aeronautical history has tried to keep the balloon still. The aero crane allows the entire balloon to turn uh, under the influence of the engines mounted on the wings. The largest commercially available helicopter today is in the 12-ton category. Uh, that is, it can lift and move 12 tons of sling load. The aero crane concept is valid through at least a thousand tons of sling load. So that at one crack, we have really jumped the capability of man to lift and emplace very heavy objects. So the aero crane is uh, a totally new concept that is rather unique in that it does not require any component development. All components are off the shelf 
The engines are standard aircraft engines. The wings are rather standard wings. The balloon technology exists. Probably the major stumbling block was that we, we really couldn't believe that this hadn't been thoroughly investigated in the past. It was so basic. It was so simple. Um, even to spend the first dollar, we had to convince ourselves that Da Vinci hadn't disclosed this many years ago. Our example of growth by innovation was not lost on others. We no longer hold first place in the economic growth race. Our long-term prospect, economists feel, depends on finding fresh sources of ideas at work. We, now more than ever, know innovation is what made us soar so high. To a scientist or an engineer, the highest compliment you can pay a solution to a problem is to call it elegant. We need elegant solutions to manage a society as complex as ours. More people should understand that. We are not traditionalists. What really interests us is the idea that if we just keep working, things will get better and easier. We want that to happen. This lab is an example of our national faith and invention, our conviction we can solve any problem. The job of creating this country, creating and recreating our very selves, isn't finished. We'll never finish.